Hello, everyone, and welcome to Biohackers Lab. I'm your host, Gary Kerwin, and on today's episode, I have Dr. Scott Scher. Dr. Scher is a board-certified internal medicine physician with an additional certification in hyperbaric oxygen medicine. He works as an integrative HBOT, or hyperbaric oxygen therapy physician, in San Francisco, and has a special interest in its use for traumatic brain injury and stroke. Dr. Scher also uses an integrative approach to hyperbaric care, using targeted lab work, diet, and supplementation to further advance HBOT's ability to heal. Scott, thanks so much for coming on for an episode for today. Thanks for having me, Gary. I appreciate it. Yeah, so the whole topic today is going to be about hyperbaric oxygen therapy, or as I said a little bit earlier, HBOT, it might be easier to say that sometimes. Um, and yeah, HBOT. you're going to... That's the other it. Way we say. Uh, all right, so HBOT. I'm going to get into the lingo here. And yeah. yeah, I want to introduce everyone to what is this concept? You know, when would you use it? Application, benefits, side effects. So yeah, we're going to deep dive into it and try to condense mm-hmm. this all into an hour for anyone listening. So <laughs> my, my first question to you is then, how would you explain what is H, HBOT or hyperbaric oxygen therapy? Yeah, it's it's the way to start usually. <laughs> um, so. I love how you pronounce the H's, by the way. It's like the uh, the breathy H comes from the UK. Um, so yeah, HBOT, HBOT, hyperbaric medicine, hyperbaric oxygen therapy, those are all ways to describe what we're talking about here. And it's relatively simple, actually. So the technology itself was actually invented in the 1600s uh, by just doing a very, actually a very easy thing. You seal a room, uh, like a steel room, chamber, like seal it up so no air goes in or out. Either you suck air in or suck air out of a chamber or you push air into a chamber, just with like an organ bellow, if you can imagine one of these old organ bellows. And that's what they described as either a hyperbaric environment, H-Y-P-E-R or H-Y-P-O, hypobaric environment. Okay. And that basically means we're changing atmospheric pressure. So that's a little bit of a history. It's like a clergyman from the UK, actually. His name was Henshaw that did all this. But so in a, in a hyperbaric chamber, we're just doing two things. We're increasing atmospheric pressure and we're increasing the amount of inspired oxygen that you're breathing. And so the way I like to think about atmospheric pressure is relatively simple. Most of what we're doing in the chamber is simulating the pressures that you would feel if you were under a certain amount of seawater. Okay. So if you're under about 33 feet of seawater, you are at what we call two atmospheres of pressure. It's one atmosphere at sea level, two atmospheres at three at, um, at 33 feet of seawater. Now above you, if you're 33 feet below the sea, you're going to have a lot of water above you and it's water is very heavy. And that's what really what we're talking about with pressure. So the pressure itself is because that water is so heavy. Now you don't feel like the water is heavy because you're weightless in it. But if you carry a bucket of water, you're going to feel that heaviness, obviously. And so we're actually simulating that atmospheric pressure in increase inside of the chamber using a certain amount of seawater equivalent. So simulating that. So number one is increasing atmospheric pressure. The second is increasing the amount of inspired oxygen that you're breathing. Now at sea level, it's 21% oxygen in the air that we breathe. And the rest of it's pretty much nitrogen. If you live in a city, you're getting some carbon monoxide and some also some other shitty gases that are coming from gasoline fumes, et cetera. Um, but mostly nitrogen. Now, if you take out that nitrogen and you just add oxygen to it, which is what we're doing in the chamber, now we're increasing the amount of inspired oxygen that you're going to breathe. Now, typically, most of us know that red blood cells carry oxygen. So we have a vascular system that has veins and arteries. The arteries bring oxygenated blood from the heart through the rest of the body, and then they go into smaller and smaller blood vessels until they reach the veins. And then the veins take blood that's deoxygenated and bringing it back to our lungs to get oxygenated again by way of our, the right side of our heart, basically. And so when it goes to the right side of our heart, to our lungs, we take a breath in, that oxygen that's in the air that we're breathing, typically 21%, gets stuck on the red blood cells in the hemoglobin molecules for hemoglobin molecules per red, per red blood cell. Now, our bodies typically do a very good job, as, as most of us know, using the oxygen in the air and creating enough oxygen carrying capacity to, to really do everything that we need to do. 
as long as we have normal lungs, basically. But you know what we're ha- what's happening in a chamber is that we're increasing the amount of inspired oxygen. So instead of 21%, you're getting 100%, and you're also pressurizing that oxygen at the same time. So all those red blood cells are, are getting, they're pretty much already saturated with an, enough oxygen at sea level already. So if you do a pulse oximeter on your finger, 97%, 100%, you'll usually see the reading. There's not a whole lot more sites to really bind oxygen. So the, the really the ways you can increase oxygen carrying capacity are by increasing the number of red blood cells in circulation. And that's done through altitude training, through doping, things like auto transfusion. So giving yourself more red blood cells or um, giving yourself a drug like epigen that increases the number of red blood cells in, in your circulation. The other way to increase oxygen carrying capacity is what we're doing in the chamber. And that's us saturating more oxygen in the plasma or the liquid of your blood. When you saturate a lot of oxygen in the plasma, it's actually liquid oxygen. That's not actually bound to any red blood cells and has a significant more ability to diffuse outside of the, the, the blood vessel itself into the tissue bed around it. So that's a significant more, significantly more potential to oxygenate your body. And so what we're doing to take it back here to what hyperbaric therapy is all about is increasing atmospheric pressure increasing inspired oxygen to drive more oxygen into circulation to capacities that are impossible in any other way. And so when you were talking with the pulse oximeter there, what reading would you have? Would you, it, you can't go above hundred percent, can you, in your body? So you can, but the pulse oximeter is only measuring the number of red blood cells in circulation that have percentage oxygen that's bound to them. Okay, so they're not measuring the amount of oxygen in the blood stream if you have blood if you have blood that's saturated with oxygen, notwithstanding the red blood cells. You know, for example, you can actually saturate so much oxygen in the liquid of your blood without the red blood cells that you don't even need red blood cells if you get to about below three ATA, which is about sixty six feet of seawater. They've done studies looking at this in animals. And they use it in, in acute trauma settings where you lose so much blood so quickly, or if you're a Jehovah's Witness and you don't want red blood cells or red blood cell transfusions, you can actually temporize people at these deep depths because you're saturating so much into the plasma itself. Now, it's not ideal, obviously. We want to give people red blood cells if they need them. <clears throat> but in, in acute settings, you can really do this. So there's no real way. So interestingly, there's another example of this, uh, Gary. If you, if you get carbon monoxide poisoning, Carbon monoxide is a molecule that gets stuck on the red blood cell and looks like if you put a pulse pulse oximeter on your finger that you're actually oxygenating well, but you're not. You're actually dying because that carbon monoxide molecule is not getting unbound from the red blood cell, from the hemoglobin molecule and going into your tissue. So pulse oximetry is a, it's, it's a good way to see how well you're doing oxygenating your red blood cells, but it's not a good way to see how well you're doing from mitochondrial O2 utilization perspective. And there's only a couple of technologies that a couple of technologies that really allow you to look at mitochondrial PO2, and none of them are very cheap, honestly. <laughs> so there's one in um, I believe it's been developed in the Netherlands that looks at mitochondrial PO2, um, and there's another uh, there's another technology that's actually based out of Las Vegas. That I'm aware of um, that's also trying to measure mitochondrial PO2, but it's not an easy, easy technology or an easy way to, there's no real easy clinical way to do it right now. Okay. Cause yeah, I mean, uh, part of the biohacking kind of world, if you want to do some self testing, some people right. would get a pulse oximeter to, to test on themselves. Do you see any value in someone who doesn't have a condition or a symptom in trying to get that number up or trying to get it into an ideal range for their age group? Well, yeah, that's interesting question. I mean, so there are some technologies that use pulse oximetry um, in, a, in, in a sort of, in, in the way you're describing it. One of the ways is something called um, exercise with oxygen therapy, EWOT. And there is one technology that I'm aware of. The way they describe it, there is a book that's entirely based on this work. It's, it's called, um, I think the, the author is Arden, if I'm not mistaken. He's a German author. And it looks at how you can use pulse oximetry as a way to understand microcirculatory flow. And if there's differences in your hands and your, in, in your arms, for example, if you have two pulse oximeters, one hand on each, and then they're, they're reading differently, it can mean there's sort of different microcirculatory problems 
that are looking that are sort of deficient on one side or the other. But a lot of that work is, you know, it's, it's it was done in like the 1980s and it hasn't been replicated recently. So I'm not sure how much stock I put into it right now. Um, but from a hyperbaric perspective, um, pulse oximetry is not very helpful. Um, it, in, in some senses, it's, it's, a, it's a relatively good marker before you go into a chamber of your overall ability to oxygenate. You know, so if people have been smokers, if they lived in carbon monoxide infested um, buildings, if they've been exposed to lots of different other gases or toxins, sometimes you'll see that number being low because they're just toxic in general. And so that's sort of like a toxicity marker. Um, if you have already have lung disease, for example, and that marker, then the pulse ox is going to be lower as well. Um, from a hyperbaric perspective, there are, I look at different markers, basically. And what that really comes down to is what's going on in the chamber. So we talked about that we're getting all this oxygen flooding the system, right? So the question is, what happens when that, when that occurs? Um, you know, oxygen is a good thing. We need it to live. Without it, we die after a couple minutes, depending on how well you, you can tolerate being without oxygen. Um, but most of us, between two and four minutes, without oxygen are going to die or be significantly uh, debilitated, debilitated from it. So um, what happens really is I put it into four categories or four or five categories. The first one is that we decrease inflammation in the chamber. And we do that immediately, and we actually do that over the long term by actually down-regulating certain pathways on the genes that are responsible for inflammation. So I kind of, I kind of put things in two categories, either the acute exposure of hyperbaric therapy or the long-term benefit of being in a chamber. So it's decreasing inflammation, reversing hypoxia, killing bugs, so bacteria, fungus, and virus that don't like high oxygen environments, and then releasing stem cells. And the stem cells get released from both the bone marrow and the neurogenic, ne the neurologic tissue as well, like from, the, from the support tissue. So, um, and it does it, those four things in both the acute setting and also the sort of long-term, uh, more protocol-driven setting as well. So there's the acute oxygen exposure, and then there's the oxygen exposure. It's more of an epigenetic exposure on the DNA itself. So epigenetics meaning the oxygen is actually causing an expression and suppression of various genes in the DNA that are manifesting in growth and healing. So in the end, what we're doing is healing wounds in the chamber, and we're basically regenerating, revitalizing, and optimizing the system overall because of what's happening in the chamber. Now, oxygen itself, if you take it even further back, is an oxidative stress. I'm sure you know what oxidative stress is, Gary. Oxidative stress is something you get from exercise. It's something you get from infection. Oxidative stress is there is it's sort of a universal um, mechanism, uni universal insult to the system. Let's call it where the system either can rebound and get better or get more optimal, or if the system is already toxic, it cannot tolerate that oxidative stress. Can actually deteriorate. So you can measure people's oxidative stress levels, and this is something that we can do in the chamber. Because we know the first three or four treatments are going to cause a rise in oxidative stress. Oxidative stress is the way actually you have that epigenetic change, that you have those long-term benefits in the chamber. But if you don't have the mechanisms, the machinery on the cellular level to really harness, sometimes what can happen is that the system can break down over time instead of getting better or getting more optimal. Like exercise, if you have the ability to oxidate your body, to stress your body, your body can then recover more strong, more robustly than it did before. And this is because in, in a hyperbaric chamber, you're having a reactive antioxidant surge to that oxidative uh, stress that we're giving to the body. So it's important to always uh, think about, in, in my mind, how healthy is somebody before they go into a chamber if we're looking for long-term benefits. Now, if there's an acute need to go into the chamber, there's ways to sort of you know, to throw the kitchen sink in the sense of making sure that you're protecting from an, from a, like an over oxidative load, but in, from a long-term maintenance or a long-term protocol perspective, it's really important in my world and in how I treat patients that, you know, you look at that oxidative stress capability initially as well. And you can measure that over time. Yeah, because that, <clears throat> that's already got me thinking that, that, as you mentioned, so the benefits there is it's uh, anti-inflammatory, um, gets more 
oxygen into your tissues, kills right. bad bugs. And there was what was the fourth one again? Sorry, releases stem cells. Stem cells That's, release. So, but now that with the oxidative stress uh, question, if someone is quite sick, mm-hmm. would that disqualify them at a certain stage from being able to go into the chamber because then they aren't able to handle the oxidative stress because they are that sick? Well, it's a really good question, and and over the years that I've been practicing. Uh, the most common example that I can give you is somebody that has Lyme disease. And so Lyme is, is a really significant sort of deregulating bug, right? It, it, can, it really does make people quite sick and they have lots of inflammation. They have lots of, lots of oxidative stress. And what I initially was realizing when I first started going into, into hyperbaric medicine is that if somebody is really sick and they get into a chamber, very often they won't benefit from being in there. Um, What we do try to do sometimes is is try to protect them as much as we can with antioxidants, you know, with good detoxification mechanisms uh, or detoxification therapies, protocols, you know, whether it be sauna, cold, colon hydrotherapy, I mean, you know, you name it. Um, But what I've realized over the years is that the, the best case scenario is that you have somebody go into the chamber when they've already sort of created a foundation of health as best as they can beforehand, even if they have Lyme, even if they have an autoimmune problem, even if they have chronic mold exposure or chronic infection or whatever. What I've gravitated to over the years is really trying to, to harness the power of hyperbaric oxygen therapy when I know it's going to be the most benefit. So I don't typically recommend people go in there when they're very, very sick without doing some of this foundational work first. And what that foundational work really looks like in my world is something that I've been getting more involved with over the last couple of years. And it's sort of a cousin to functional medicine, but it's even a little bit different than that. It's called health optimization medicine. And health optimization medicine is a foundational approach to health founded by a colleague of mine. Um, His name is Dr. Ted Achacoso. And And Ted found that if you focused on the health of the cells, health of the gut, health of the immune system, often a lot of the other problems, conditions, symptoms would go away when you just did that. And so my practice gravitated after my experience treating some pretty sick people in the chamber and noticing that they didn't really benefit from it. If they did benefit, it was a really tough slog to try to get them through it because we had to try to antioxidize them. We had to try to detox them. And sometimes they would get really sick getting in the chamber. I mean, I had a nurse that I work with that had Lyme, for example, that, you know, her family had to take her every day in a wheelchair to get into the chamber because she was so sick. Now, eventually she did get better, but then she relapsed about you know, three or four months later um, with the severe sickness again, you know, the Lyme in this, in this case, um, even though she did really well after hyperbaric therapy. And what all this really means to me, and I've had a number of these things happen over the years, is that if you don't work on that foundation first, if you're really sick, you are likely not going to benefit over the long term getting into the chamber. Um, Because you're kind of taking from, you know, a bank that doesn't have any money in it, right? You're taking it on credit. You know, hyperbaric therapy can work. It can can change the epigenetic expression of various genes, upregulating, downregulating, new blood vessels, kill bugs. But if you don't have a system that really is full of, of money in this case, you, know, you are probably going to, you're, you're kind of buying credit, right? So, you know, you're going on credit here. So, and, and so that, that's been my experience over the years. Now, if you have somebody that's healthy and doing well, and they're overall, you know, they're just looking to optimize their performance, optimize their physiology, um, hyperbaric therapy is great and you don't need to do a whole lot before you go into the chamber. Um, Sometimes I do recommend various things depending on what the goals are, other technologies, other practices or whatever. But um, for really sick people, I don't usually recommend getting into a chamber right away is the short answer. Yeah, And that's a great tip there, I think, already, because people might think it's going to be a first line response. You know, I'm so and Lyme is a common chronic condition out there. Mm -hmm. I'm sure a few people listening to this may have either experienced or going through it themselves or know someone who has. So that's a great practical example that. Don't, yeah. and, and I know with Lyme, a lot of people just try go from pillar to post and they're looking for multiple treatments. They might think, no, I just jumped straight in a hyperbaric chamber and that's going to solve right. it. Um, but as with anything, there's a clinical decision that has to be made here and just yeah. to see if you're going to be at that point. And that's where you said with your integrative approach that you're going to use lab work and other f- 
markers to say you now are at the, at a suitable place to go into the chamber? Right. I mean, we can always help and supplement if we need to uh, with antioxidants before the chamber, making them ketogenic as well. So I can give ketone supplements uh, or, or MCT, for example, before they go in. And that does protect from oxidative stress. So we will do that in pa patients that are very sick. We'll also do that in patients that are very not sick <laughs> because that's also going to make them feel better. And it's also important to know, you know what kind of chamber you're using, Gary, and also understanding that each pressure has a different, uh, there's a different sweet spot for different pressures, let's say. So there's different types of chambers. And so we talked about the physiology, right? So initially, we're just talking about inspired oxygen increase, increasing the atmospheric pressure, driving more oxygen into circulation, decreasing inflammation, reversing hypoxia, killing bugs, and releasing stem cells, right? So that's, that's great. But now we have to talk about it. Like, well, what are our specific goals here? Right. So are they more neurological? Are they more systemic? Um, and so when somebody comes and, and talks to me about hyperbaric therapy, they'll like they'll always ask me, because that's the most commonly known, is like, oh, can I get a chamber in my house? Can I use this? And will that be enough for me? And so the answer is it depends. Um, the chambers that are home use, soft chambers, only go to 1.3 atmospheres, which is about 23 feet of seawater. And they're not, they are not chambers that I recommend if you have a systemic issue, if you have autoimmunity, if you have a complex medical problem, if you have lots of infection floating around, um, I don't recommend them. The, the chamber is really, the 1.3 chambers are really probably best for people, people that are sort of optimal performers already, or they're looking at sort of neurocognitive related conditions, because that's where we think the 1.3 to 1.75 or even to 2.0 that treatment range, which is about 23 feet of seawater to about 33 feet of seawater uh, equivalent in pressure, that's more neurologically focused. So that's where most of our patients with traumatic brain injury are being treated. That's where most of our patients with, um, uh, if, if they have neurologic conditions in general are being treated. The soft chambers are probably good also for recovery types of things like recovery from workouts, from jet lag, you know, overall cognitive wellness, those kinds of things. But if you really want, you know, more systemic treatment, the 1.5 atmospheres to 2.4 is where that range. And those are medical grade chambers. Those are great. Those are chambers that you can find at facilities. So, you know, in my perfect world, you have like sort of like a hub and spoke model where you have a hub where you have the, the medical grade hyperbaric chamber that goes from 1.5 to 2.4. The further, the deeper you go, the more stem cells you release, by the way, the deeper you go, the more blood vessels that you can create systemically, the deeper you go, the more inflammation you can downregulate systemically. Now that's to a point, you know, you don't want to really go below 2.8 in general, because then that's causing too much oxidative stress and you have a risk of having um, having complications of oxygen toxicity, which I can talk about. But in general, 1.5 to 2.4 is our sort of window of treatment uh, for the most part. And systemically, it's 2.0 to 2.4 usually. So, um, and then the nuances are, are various, of course. And that's what the, where the N of 1 and the biohacking kind of come in, in the sense of what is a personalized treatment regimen for you. Um, but it, the key also other than the chamber type, is also to know what is your goal? Like, do you have a short-term goal? Like, are you just trying to recover from an injury? Are you just trying to recover from something that happened a couple days ago? Or is this something that's been more ongoing for a longer period of time that you have had, you know, 30 years of, of X or 10 years of Y? Or, um, and then when it, that happens, just like, you know, Gary, you can't expect, like, you know, one or two treatments is going to be, you know, is going to be the answer for you, right? Or even one modality for that matter, right? So it's about uh, understanding where you are and sort of meeting that meeting that person there, and then creating, in my world, an integrative plan to help uh, with the you know just cultivating health in, in in patients, right? And helping recover whatever it may be. <laughs> yeah, and uh, you know I love it there that you explain those numbers too, because what that gets thinking in my mind is then we've got to think of systems. So as you said, the lower the pressure, it sounds like it's good for the neurological system. Right. But maybe the deeper you go, that's when we hear about people going into hyperbaric chamber for bone healing. And right. when so 
depending on what system in your body you're looking to influence may may determine how deep you need to go into the hyperbaric chamber. And then I guess the factor of duration, frequency, um, like right. the clinical prescription as to what's best for your situation. Right. Yeah. Duration is usually between 60 and 120 minutes in a chamber. Um, and frequency is usually, so it depends, but usually it is successive days in the sense that it's, you know, Monday through Friday for the weekends off and the weekends off between kind of thing. So for 20, 40, sometimes even more treatments, if you have a long-term issue, symptom, condition that needs to recover. So for example, somebody that's had a traumatic brain injury or a stroke, if it's been you know three months or so a- after that incident, typically it's a 30 to 40 treatment regimen where they go Monday through Friday with the weekends off for that period of time. So it's you know two months kind of thing. And the reason for that is that when I talked about, you know, decreasing inflammation, reversing hypoxia, stem cell release, killing bugs, there is the, that's working long-term by creating that epigenetic change on the DNA. So expression and suppression of various genes that allow the, what I like to call the scaffolding of our tissue to regenerate, right? The new blood vessels, new stem cells that are creating those blood vessels, and also new connective tissue, new supportive structures. And so you're recreating that scaffolding of tissue that's been injured. And that takes time. It's not something that happens with just one or two treatments. Now, on the other end of it, if you've had an acute stroke, or you've had an acute traumatic brain injury, or acute trauma, even a surgery, or even acute you know, injury like an ACL tear, for example, okay? What we're really looking to do in the chamber is just synergize with the body's own healing process and make it happen faster. So I have athletes that are coming in and I have patients that have had plastic surgery and they don't want to have raccoon eyes for, you know, for 10 days. They want to have it for five days, you know, so we can do that in the chamber. We can heal, we can synergize with the body's own healing process and happen, you know, depending on the person between 30 and 70% faster than the body can do on its own. That's fantastic. In our, in my country, the insurance companies are never going to cover that because the body's going to, you're going to heal either way, but it can be very important for somebody if they're an athlete or they just don't want to be laid up for, you know, for, for six months, they want to be laid up for three months, you know? So that's, that's a significant amount of time back to work, back to, you know, traveling or whatever it is that they're doing weekend warrior, (laughs) whatever, you know, if you're familiar with that term, that's the people that like, you know, work at desk jobs during the week and then get crazy on the weekends and always injure themselves. That's who we see, you know? So, <laughs> yeah. And it's like the 40 year olds that are still, still trying to play soccer. Like, like they were 20 years old again and then they tear ACLs and shoulders. So, anyway. anyway. <laughs> yeah. And, and, uh, what's really popular nowadays is cycling, you know, so suddenly, yeah. as you said, you get that, you suddenly get that cycling bug when you go, um, to a certain age group and then yeah, we can worry, do racing, hurt yourself, fall off the bike. Right. Right. Uh, yeah. So it's funny. I, I talk about this with some of my racing buddies, you know, the, the soft chamber is like I was talking about are portable. They're more neurologically focused, but I do think they also have some, some ability to help with injury recovery and also sort of like the regular sort of muscle aches and pains that you get from working out hard is they're going to help with blood flow and they're going to help with lactic acid washout probably too. Um, on one end, on the other end, whoops, sorry, <laughs> on the other end of it is, um, to help oxygenate the system, right? So you are going to have more oxygen in circulation. We talked about oxygen carrying capacity. So if you can potentially get into a chamber and then go and do your race almost immediately afterwards, um, you have that oxygen circulation for about an hour or so afterwards too. This is actually a pretty cool concept because it's an interesting study that was done by some of my colleagues in Minnesota uh, for severe traumatic brain injured patients. What they did is that they put them in a chamber um, and then they gave them 100% oxygen by a face mask after being in the chamber. Um, and so they found that when they did that, it was better than just being in a chamber for that 60-minute session, that the body was utilizing oxygen better in the 24-hour period between the hyperbaric sessions, better if they put on a face mask afterwards. So what I've been doing with some of my friends and colleagues that are either in the optimal performance world or in the severe injured, severely injured world is trying to get them to come out of the chamber and then use oxygen via face mask or nasal cannula for whatever it is they need to do afterwards. So whether that's rehabilitation, physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, or if it's more mental sort of multitask performance related activities, tasks, et cetera. 
because there's been some interesting studies that have actually shown that hyperbaric therapy does increase multitasking ability. It does increase um, frontal lobe executive function ability. So retrieval of long-term memories from the hippocampal area into the short-term memory and vice versa, getting things into long-term storage. So I'm always looking for ways how you can optimize that, of course, right? So, um, and that's why I, I pair as, as much as I can, you know, being inside the chamber with also external oxygen stimulus, if I can. If I can't do that, at least trying to use that post-treatment period for some of these tasks, you know, whether it might be anything that I just mentioned. And even before that, even inside the chamber, you can also look to see uh, what kinds of things you can do in there, depending on how big the chamber is. Um, if you have a single person chamber um, that you're kind of lying down in, it's not that easy, of course, to like you know, do a ton of stuff, but you can, you can do, you can do, if you're, if you've had a brain injury, for example, or a stroke, you can sort of work on sort of, you know, your finger nose, you can work on your coordination, things like that, um, which I'll have people do. I'll have people count, you know, if you've heard of serial sevens, like it's a serial seven task is starting at a hundred and, and subtracting seven, subtracting seven. You can do those kinds of little things. And, um, but if you're in a, a different type of chamber, a different type of chamber called a multi-place chamber where you have multiple people in a chamber all together. These are mostly in hospitals, but even outside of hospitals, you'll find some of them too. You can have people go in there and, you know, do, you know, do uh, more physical therapy kinds of things as well. So you can do lots of, it's, it's a lot of fun all the things you can think about doing. Um, but what, but it's also important you try to quantify all this stuff too, of course. So I always, I always get excited that, yeah, you can do all this stuff, but let's start like, you know, with one thing, you know, if we can, and then try to work up from there. And that's how the protocols work too. You know, we usually start at one level and then we see how people are doing and then we can sort of either go down or go up a little bit or you know, depending on, on how they're doing as well. Yeah, so just to revisit what you just said there, so there's a benefit to doing hyperbaric oxygen therapy, and then as you've come out the chamber, then putting on an oxygen mask and actually exposing yourself to more oxygen post chamber. Right. Yeah, that looks like especially if you're looking at doing something specific from like either rehabilitation perspective, a cognitive task perspective. So there absolutely looks like there is a benefit to that. Absolutely. Yeah. But even without having the oxygen available to you when you get out of the chamber it still looks like, I mean, that's a still a very good time to start really thinking about optimizing whatever you're looking to do in the chamber, um, just, you know, outside of the chamber once you finish. So like I said, if you're coming in there because you have an ACL injury or you just had a knee replacement, um, you want to try to do some, some of that therapy if you can in the chamber, but right afterwards, whether you have oxygen available to you or not, you should be trying to do flexibility outside of the chamber afterwards. You should be trying to do, you know, whatever it is that you're doing to rehab right after you get out. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, with the stroke, what you mentioned, that is such a common condition in the world and only growing. So I can imagine you're trying to do like mirror neuron exercises inside right. there. But right. And I try to get them ketogenic too, by the way, if I can, yeah. because uh, what I've found is that um, it optimizes blood flow in some capacities. It seems to. I mean, we don't really have a lot of data here. My colleagues in Florida, you know, Dom Diagostino and his lab down there, they have some initial preliminary studies that look like that if you're ketogenic, you have more blood flow to areas that have tissue injury, whether that be like a diabetic foot ulcer, which is a condition we treat in the chamber, or we think probably like a traumatic brain injury or a stroke. Because what happens if you have a TBI or a stroke, especially in the acute setting, there's going to be a lot of inflammation there, right? There's going to be a lot of swelling hopefully not too much swelling, um, but hyperbaric therapy can help decrease swelling, decrease inflammation, because it actually, you know, interestingly enough, it actually constricts blood vessels, which you would think would be a bad thing, you know, because you don't, if when you constrict a blood vessel, you're going to get less blood flow through that blood vessel. But if you have a blood vessel that's injured in the acute setting, you want that blood vessel to be constricted down so it doesn't leak a bunch of stuff into the tissue, causing inflammation even to be even worse what actually happens in a chamber, because we talked about all that blood that's being saturated in the plasma itself, the net is even though that you've constricted the blood vessel, you can actually get more oxygen to tissue because there's so much oxygen in plasma already. So the net is that you're still getting more oxygen delivered, despite that blood vessel being slightly constricted. That being said, I have paired hyperbaric therapy with other vasodilatory types of stimuli beforehand to help with and to overcome if you don't have like an acute, you know, trauma where there's swelling and, you know, acute inflammation. 
some of those kinds of therapies, things that you're probably familiar with to a significant degree, but like cold. So cold thermogenesis, whether it be like a cold tub or cryotherapy, you're going to have a constriction of your blood vessels when you're in the cold, but then you have a reactive vasodilation. So you can use that vasodilatory response, go into the chamber and you're going to get better microcirculatory flow of oxygen because you've opened things up and there's going to be less constriction in the chamber itself. So I've paired it with, with, uh, with cryo, with, uh, with cold, you know, from a tub, for example, we also look at, you know, uh, like something like niacin, for example, right? Niacin is a, it causes a flushing that most of your, your, your listeners probably know about, but, um, so niacin flush is basically causing vasodilation of blood vessels. And so have you ever had the niacin flush before, Gary? Definitely. Yes. Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah. It's, it's not very comfortable, right? But you can actually use that as a way to help get more oxygen to the microcirculation. There's other, there's other technologies that I use as well. Um, there is pulsed electromagnetic field technology, which there's lots of different types and varieties, but that also helps with microcirculatory circulatory flow. So we've been, we've been experimenting more with that and how it can help get more oxygen to your tissues in, in sort of in facilitation with, with hyperbaric chambers. Uh, what else? Uh, there's lots of other technologies that I try to use, um, either w- either paired with hyperbaric therapy before or after. Another one, just to mention, and I'm you know I'm rambling, but is um, is neurofeedback. You know, for example, so if you're really looking to retrain your brain, where there are now portable, um, there are portable neurofeedback technologies you can bring inside a soft chamber. So we're talking about those soft chambers again for for like neurocognitive optimization. You can use neurofeedback in there to help retrain your brain uh, while you're in there because you're getting more oxygen. So again, I think I mentioned in the beginning that oxygen's in your blood vessels because we have so much more in there. It's now diffusing outside of that blood vessel to a more significant, significant degree. So you have this increased oxygen diffusion, just like osmosis, right? More oxygen is going to where there's less oxygen and it's getting further into the tissues. So if you have a, a TBI, a brain injury, um, any other neurologic insult, even Parkinson's or Alzheimer's, we're seeing this now too. Um, you can see how the brain, when you retrain it under oxygenated conditions, just functions better. And, and so we're using this now clinically. Um, but you know, the one thing I want to say, <laughs> I keep talking. One more thing I want to say about that is that you know that hyperbaric therapy, in these cases, most of these cases, especially if there's been an injury that's been longstanding or an ongoing condition like Alzheimer's, for example, for example, or Parkinson's, it's not just about being in the chamber. Again, um, I can get them ketogenic. I can put them on a low carb diet. Um, that's just sort of one thing, but hyperbaric therapy is going to be a synergizing tool here. It's not going to be a cure for Alzheimer's or Parkinson's. I just want to make sure I'm clear about that. Yeah, I think that's pretty clear, but I like it yeah. too there where you're talking about how you can enhance your hyperbaric experience before yeah. you go in so you so the type of diet you eat does make a difference and if you're more ketogenic the ketone bodies there seem to be making a difference and then how you influence your how your uh, capillaries and your blood vessels right. are either constricted or dilated and you want them dilated before you go into the right chamber right. okay not so um, dilated that you're going to pass out of course but they you know dilated enough that like that you're going to get more microcircular circulatory flow potentially yeah and you were talking about using cold thermogenesis and then getting the reactive dilation. So exposing yourself to cold, constricting, and then maybe 30 minutes afterwards, the cold, then you're dilating enough. Or, But you could also use sauna, could you, um, to you dilate yourself and then go yeah. in? But I, in general, recommend sauna afterwards because it's more of a detox kind of thing. So versus the, the cold tends to be less detoxifying in, in, in some capacity. So there's no right way to do this. In general... I've just found it's difficult to go into a sauna and sweat and lose a lot of water and then go into a chamber uh, because it's just, you know, you don't get to, you can drink water in there, but you can't really pee because you're in a chamber. So it's, it's a little bit more difficult. That's the same thing with IVs and, and things like that. We talk about using IV vitamin C and I use other IV formulations for the chamber as well. Sometimes as an antioxidant boost, if they have high oxidative burden, for example, um, but if we're using it for something like synergizing with cancer treatment, we use high dose IV vitamin C sometimes. I, I usually do that afterwards because IV vitamin C is like a huge bag of fluid. And then so if you do that right before you go into a chamber, it's gonna be it's gonna be difficult for them to get through treatment, for example. So um, 
And so before the, they go into a chamber, if a patient goes, before a patient goes into a chamber, a lot of it really depends, right? It depends on how much time we have, how long standing their issue is. If it's an acute injury, I'm almost always just, you know, get into the chamber. We're going to optimize healing. We're going to optimize the whole wound healing process. Um, maybe we can do a couple things like help with antioxidant capacity. We can use some technologies to help with, like we're discussing, um, you know, helping with, uh, with vasodilation, um, helping with, you know, basic sort of uh, functional bioactive supplements, depending on what's happening. Like if it's a brain injury, I always recommend, you know, something like a sort of a suite of brain injury specific or neurologic specific supplements uh, if, if we can. But if it's a more longstanding issue, like we were talking about in the beginning, I really try to focus on their foundational health first. So that I have a program that I try, uh, that, that I often recommend with people that is called Health Optimization Medicine or HOME for short, that takes them through a foundational approach, looking at their gut health, you know, food sensitivities, immune health, looking at their, uh, their metabolic health, basically. And then vitamins, minerals, nutrients, toxins. Because the other thing that I, I find is that, you know, if, if you need to be able to harness the ability to use this oxygen. So, you know, what is oxygen doing at its core is it's an electron receptor in the mitochondria, allowing you to create more energy at the cellular level, right? The mitochondria being the batteries of our cells. So that's what oxygen is doing. It's, it's basically just an electron receptor um, in the end. So, and then what happens is that electron, you know, comes and makes water from, with the oxygen molecule. So it's fantastic if you have more oxygen, but you need to be able to make more energy. And it's not just about oxygen, right? It's about all the other things that you need in the citric acid cycle and glycolysis, et cetera, to make the oxygen, uh, to make the, the energy, you know, and then use that oxygen. So I always try to take a step back if we have time and say, okay, let's make sure you have the right of the right materials, uh, your your bank is full of money so that you can really harness the power of this treatment to manifest healing in the most optimal way possible. So that's, that's really what I, I hope to at least provide for most of my clients that are, that, that can do it if they can. I mean, I, I work with functional medicine doctors too. I work with lots of other docs and lots of other fields and try to work together in a way that can really optimize the timing of the hyperbaric exposure. But if it's an acute injury, if it's an acute trauma, um, then I just say get in the chamber and we can optimize physiology as we go. So here's an interesting one, it, which would be the complete opposite to hyperbaric oxygen therapy is intermittent uh -huh. hypoxia training. Uh -huh. So uh -huh. there's a branch of medicinal researchers who are looking to reduce the amount of uh, oxygen you get exposed to through breathing techniques. Uh, how would you come, do you think there's a benefit to that? Or would you combine the two together where you hyper oxygenating yourself and then also reducing the amount of oxygen you're getting exposed through breathing techniques? Yeah, lots of things to say there. So the first thing I would say is actually in the chamber itself, we are causing, uh, we can cause, we're actually causing relative hypoxia. And let me tell you why. So, you know, you're going into a chamber, we're having you breathe hundred percent oxygen at two atmospheres of pressure, which is 33 feet of seawater. And what we do is that every 30 minutes or so, we have you take off your oxygen mask and just breathe the air in the chamber, okay? So that air in the chamber that you've been pressurized in is 21% oxygen, okay? So we brought you from 100% oxygen to 21% oxygen. And we're doing that for two reasons. The first reason, the reason why it was first started was because there is a potential that if you get oxygen exposure at these numbers, this amount for long periods of time, it can cause oxygen toxicity. And oxygen toxicity can manifest in several ways, which we can talk about. Um, but for, this, for the purpose of this conversation, we're gonna focus on the other reason why we do this, is that when you do that, you're going from 100% oxygen to 21% oxygen in the air that you're breathing. And that's a relative hypoxia. That relative hypoxia stimulates the same things that would be stimulated if you were in a hypobaric HYPO or a low oxygen environment, like a mountainous environment, for example. And those same things get stimulated. So what that means, so you get new mitochondria, you get new blood vessels, you get inflammation down regulation without the potential that you're going fully hypoxic so that you're in altitude, for example. So the, one of the reasons why I think hyperbaric therapy is so effective 
it doesn't have as much of a downside to intermittent hypoxia for those who are not very that are not that are not well to start off with um, is that it, because you're at a relative hypoxia but that hypoxia is actually 21 percent oxygen in the chamber okay so that's the first thing i would say the second thing i would say is that i do think intermittent hypoxia for those that are relatively healthy can be a good thing because it does the same thing as i'm talking about here um, but it also probably works faster in some ways um, than doing relative hypoxia at hyperbaric environment pressures. So the relative hypoxia of going on an exercise bike and breathing 15% oxygen versus 21% oxygen, and then breathing 21 or even 100% oxygen, um, there is probably some significant uh, physiologic benefits to that because you are changing the oxygen dissociation curve from a, phys uh, from a hemodynamic perspective or from a uh, it's not hemodynamic. There's another word, uh, but anyway, from the physiologic perspective, and so I do think that there are some benefits to that. Um, so it really depends on what the person's goals are, and also how healthy they are to start. Now, sometimes what I've done is that somebody goes through hyperbaric treatment with me in the chamber, and then they do intermittent hypoxia uh, on a bike, for example, to help modulate or simulate similar kinds of physiologic shifts from a hyperbaric chamber. Because I do believe that there probably are some similar, there definitely are similarities between the two. I just think the intermittent hypoxia, when you go below 21% oxygen, is more inflammatory in general than the, the inflammation that we see with relative hypoxia at hyperbaric pressures. So it really depends on the person is what it comes down to. But I do think it could be beneficial. Okay. Yeah. I mean, because uh, that was the, the one topic that came up. I was speaking with um, some in a previous guest who talks about, you know, the different breathing techniques, like the Wim Hof breathing technique yeah, or yeah. a lot of those. And it was about intermittent hypoxia training. So saying that, uh, should we train our bodies to, to be better at less oxygen levels? Uh, but in this case, we're kind of giving it, even, we're trying to get it better at high oxygen levels right, too. Right. So. It's, it's interesting. Yeah. I mean, I definitely have a lot of colleagues that, that do Wim Hof and that, and then I, that, and other breathing techniques where, the, where you're looking at sort of the intermittent hypoxic exposure. I think it's good to a degree, but I do worry over the long term that is, it is causing, you know, over the long term potentially inflammation, you know, inflammation that may not be well, uh, well, um, uh, it, it, may, it might be difficult for some people over a long period of time to tolerate. So, but I think if otherwise you're, you're healthy, I think it could be a great thing for sure. Um, but I, I do worry about the intermittent hypoxia over a long period of time. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that the Wim Hof guys and Wim Hof himself will talk about is how you, know, you stop breathing, you know, you basically, you hyperventilate, you blow off a bunch of CO2, and then you do exercise and things like that. And then you take a deep breath in. I, I think what that's doing is is similar to what's happening on a bike. You know, for example, when you're you're basically making yourself hypoxic, and then you're bringing yourself back to normal oxygen, you are changing that oxygen dissociation curve. So more oxygen is going to flood the tissues. Um, so I think that's a good thing, and I do think that's why there's been a lot of benefits for a lot of people that are doing these breathing techniques. And you know, some people will ask me if they can do it, like Wim Hof in the chamber, for example, and I tell them absolutely not. Don't, please, <laughs> because I don't want people holding their breath in the chamber. Um, because the reason why we breathe is because of CO2 retention, not because of oxygen. So um, in the chamber, people can forget to breathe, let's say. So, and then as a result of that, um, you know, they can, I, I haven't had any problems, but um, I've heard stories of people like holding their breath in the chamber for like eight minutes, which is not a good idea, you know? So um, I don't recommend any of that. <laughs> <laughs> uh you touched on a topic earlier about cancer uh oh. i would i would be interested to know then so i mean again we talked said how prevalent stroke is but of course cancer is i mean is one of the most prevalent conditions out there would you say that all cancer types would benefit from hyperbaric chamber exposure then mm, this is a, a lecture in itself my friend gary here but um <laughs> so I, what i like to say initially here is that hyperbaric therapy is not a treatment for cancer Okay, it is a synergistic approach to other cancer treatments. And there's about five different ways that hyperbaric therapy is used in cancer. The first is actually approved by our insurance companies here in the US. It's called radiation injury. So if you've been radiated for cancer treatment and you have a radiation injury that's long standing, six months or greater, then hyperbaric therapy is an approved treatment modality to help you regenerate and heal your tissue. 
That's because hyperbaric therapy is regenerating the tissue with new stem cells, new connective tissue, new blood vessels, like we talked about. Number one is radiation injury. The second way hyperbaric therapy is used is in, is in uh, chemo sensitization. So helping chemotherapy be more sensitive to tumors and killing tumor cells. And the reason for that is the combination of the oxidative stress of the chemotherapy and the, the oxidative stress of the hyperbaric therapy exposure. Okay. The third way is in radiation. Radiation is oxygen sensitive. So if you want radiation to work on a cancer, on a tumor, it needs to be getting oxygen. A lot of cancer, which we'll talk about in a minute, is hypoxic. So that's like a hypoxic core, not a lot of oxygen getting to it. So if you can flood it with oxygen using a hyperbaric environment, which we talked about again, diffuses more oxygen outside of the blood vessel because there's more in circulation, just like osmosis more radiation is going to get to that tumor if more oxygen is in it. So the, more, the most common type of cancer they've been looking at is called glioblastoma, which is a brain cancer, which is a very terrible brain cancer that kills lots of people. So that's the third way. So we talked about, uh, again, radiation injury, chemosensitization, radiation sensitization. Um, those are not covered by insurance companies in this country. Uh, the fourth way is um, in a surgical oncology. So if you have a surgical procedure, oncologic procedure, it doesn't have to be oncologic, oncologic, any surgery, hyperbaric therapy is going, going to make you recover faster. So you recover from your injuries, from the trauma of surgery, the swelling, the inflammation, the recovery, all that's going to happen faster in a hyperbaric chamber. Now, the next way, I think it's the fifth way now, is, is with a combined approach um, from an alternative perspective. And that's a very large category. But the major ways that's being looked at these days are hyperbaric therapy in the ketogenic diet, and then hyperbaric therapy and other alternative modalities and other sort of dietary strategies and other modalities as well. But the ketogenic diet and hyperbaric therapy is the best described right now. And that's because the ketogenic diet uh, potentially starves cancer cells of their major nutrient, which would be glucose most cancers, not all cancers. And then hyperbaric therapy is causing more trauma by causing more of an oxidative load on those cancer cells. So the combination of the oxidative load of the, um, of the hyperbaric exposure, along with the oxidative load where the cancer cells can't protect themselves as well, because they're not making energy as efficiently without glucose floating around, um, seems to be a potentially uh, a, a pretty significant strategy to help with, mo with some cancer management. What's also good to remember though about the combination of those two is, is it's not mutually exclusive to anything else. It's not mutually exclusive to chemotherapy, to radiation, to surgery. So often we have people doing all of this, right? They have, they're ketogenic, they're getting hyperbaric therapy, they're doing chemo, they're doing radiation, they're getting surgery. Um, they're, but they might be doing chemotherapy in a different way. They might be doing you know, insulin potentiated chemotherapy or heat potenti potentiated chemotherapy. They might be getting radiation exposure that's more targeted and, and less sort of you know, more you know, systemic. I mean, that's not systemic radiation, but radiation is getting better is really what I mean. So I am agnostic in the sense of that I don't recommend people don't do conventional therapy. I don't recommend people just do hyperbaric therapy in the ketogenic diet. I, and I don't even work with patients that have cancer on my own. I don't ever do that. I always recommend that they have a treating cancer physician. And I have a number of integrative cancer doctors that I rec recommend when patients you know, come to me with, with cancer diagnoses. And depending on where they're at and kind of what they're, where, you know, what they're interested in, kind of, I'll recommend them to, to various people along the way. Um, so, the, and the final way we use hyperbaric therapy in cancer, I think this is number six, kind of, <laughs> is we use it in a more of a holistic approach for quality of life. So in people that are getting chemotherapy and they're anemic and they're, and they have another one is called chemo brain or radiation brain, where they've had sort of generalized inflammation from the treatment exposure itself. We do treat patients um, and, and they do feel better. It's not because we're helping them with their cancer. It's just we're helping them sort of, you know, feel better because of their cancer, let's say. So, and the protocols for each of those six different types is different. Um, but in general, that's a lecture of hyperbaric therapy and cancer in five minutes. Yeah, I know. Uh, I always touch on the, the, the topics where you could have degrees <laughs> in them. <laughs> but that's, that's the idea. And then the one thing I would also say is that 
I, in the beginning, I was talking about sort of successive days, like Monday through Friday, days of treatment in a hyperbaric chamber. And that's because it's that epigenetic stress, that intermittent, intermittent hyperbaric oxygen stress on the DNA that's causing those changes, that's changing the DNA expression, suppression of various genes, okay? But in cancer, we're not really looking for that as much, at least for the, the killing of cancer cells, okay? So that's usually used more of an intermittent exposure usually one to two treatments at a time because we really don't want, don't want the body to have a reactive antioxidant surge to help protect the normal cells, but also protect cancer cells. So, um, you know, there's been a couple of reviews also, I should mention, because we are creating new blood vessels in a hyperbaric chamber. There have been some concerns that hyperbaric therapy can make cancer grow and reasonably so, but there's been no studies that have shown that hyperbaric therapy has any pro cancer growth effect at all. In fact, it seems to have a mild regressive effect. And this is what it comes down to when we're talking about how cancer blood vessels grow and how cancer itself tends to be more hypoxic, more low oxygen, and creating blood vessels in a low oxygen environment using different stimuli than regular cells grow. You know, we talk about angiogenesis. That's how blood, that's the, you know, the, the scientific term, the medical term for new blood vessel growth. So cancer cells have angiogenesis that's out of control. And so, the, and they grow more of in a hypoxic environment. So there's no indication that hyperbaric therapy has any pro-cancerous growth potential. Well, that was going to be exactly my next question because that you, you, you do think, but hang on, a hyperbaric chamber creates more, more growth, more capillary growth, you know, blood cell, blood, blood vessel growth mm -hmm. and that's what you want to avoid with cancer but as you said it there's a, there is a difference there so that's yeah. that's good to know yeah um uh, one last one i know again i've only got limited time with you and we could have an all-day lecture on this but when you yeah. were talking about with the stem cell growth after hyperbaric chamber it's getting quite popular now where people are injecting stem cells into themselves so does this to me sounds like an optimal time that you would do hyperbaric chamber treatment and then you would do the stem cell extraction to do the stem cell therapy on yourself? Would, is that the, do, right. do you think so that makes have, logical sense? Yeah. So we have, I'm working with, with more regenerative physicians and other technologies and, and people that are doing stem cells, doing exosomes, doing PRP, um, all of these other you know, factors that are being used, blood based stem cells, stem cells from embryonic cells, stem cells from, umbilicals. I mean, there's lots of different things that are happening and, and, and I'm not an expert in all of that, but what I can say is that hyperbaric therapy is exponentially increasing the amount of stem cells that are being released into circulation or that are being mobilized, um, after just a couple of treatments. So what we have been doing <clears throat> is, uh, many fold, but the first thing as to describe what you were just describing is that if you are going to get stem cells harvested, the best way to do that is after a couple treatments at deeper depth hyperbaric therapy, so 2.0 to 2.4. And we typically would do that for two to four treatments to try to get more harvest of stem cells from your bone marrow. So they're using this clinically in leukemia and lymphoma as well, actually, in people that are getting uh, full you know, chemotherapy to, to irradiate, basically, or just to kill off their bone marrow. Then they get stem cells transplanted. And so the, we know now that um, hyperbaric therapy can help with that harvest beforehand so that they can get more stem cells reintroduced when their bone marrow is now clean of the cancer, for example. So it's being used clinically, but it's also used in, being used in optimal performance uh, from the stem cell perspective. We also know that hyperbaric therapy tends to hone, it tends to make stem cells go to areas where there's inflammation or injury. So we think that even after stem cells are re-injected or reintroduced into the system, that hyperbaric therapy can help those stem cells work better in the areas where they need to go or where the objective is for them to work. It's also being used in PRP. Um, so PRP is obviously you know, platelet-rich plasma and has all the growth factors that allow uh, the tissue to try, try to heal itself. We think that hyperbaric therapy is also helping with that process creating the stem cell mobilization to bring stem cells from our own body to those areas where there's injury and then help, again, heal that, 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 that tissue as well. So we have like lots of athletes that are coming in after PRP and after stem cells and, and helping you know, with the healing process in that capacity as well. So some of the other pieces like the exosomes and V cells and some of these other types of things that are happening, 
I don't have a lot of experience yet in the chamber with, but you know, they're, they're coming. Um, I would just give you one story. I have a, a friend of mine. He's become a friend. He's a, he had a traumatic brain injury uh, surfing. He's a surfer over here in California. And he did a number of different things to try to help recover. He broke his neck. And so, and he was in a collar, you know, thankfully no paralysis or anything like that, that healed. But then he realized that his brain wasn't functioning, right? He had a really bad brain injury. And so he ended up getting hyperbaric therapy. He got about 85% better. He ended up doing um, hormone therapy. So hormone replacement therapy related to TBI. And he got about 90, 90% better, 95% better. And then he did, then he did stem cells and he, and he was hundred percent better. So just to give you a sense that you know, a lot of times it's not just one thing that's going to do it here. It's going to be a number of things that are done you know, methodically that can really help. I mean, he was really working on his diet. He was working on his relationships. He, would, you know, he has two kids and his wife, and, and he's working on the sort of the psychological aspects of having a brain injury, which is huge. I can heal somebody's brain injury, but if they still have the same psychological loops that they had when they first, you know, because, because they've had a brain injury for months, if not years, and those, those loops aren't going to change in a chamber. What's going to change is the physiology, but if you still have those cognitive loops, it, you're still going to have those cognitive loops. And so it's really important that you're taking this on, on an integrative approach. And so, you know, my world of hyperbaric medicine is an integrative one. So, you know, when I consult with people, like I was saying to you before I start, we started, Gary, like I feel like I'm a conductor, really. You know, I, I, I try to meet people where they are and to find them resources to help them. My main practice is hyperbaric oxygen therapy, dialing in protocols, changing things as needed but also the health optimization medicine, uh, which is a foundational approach to health, which is more of a blood urine stool approach. I do that, but I also recommend psychiatrists, psychologists, neurofeedback, you know, cannabis, you know, if it's just CBD or THC, um, recommend um, you know, lots of different practitioners all over the world, depending on what's happening and then work in collaboration. And that includes functional medicine doctors, conventional doctors that are cardiologists and pulmonary doctors, and you name it. You know, the thing about my training is that I'm a conventionally trained doc, but I also have a very, I have a lot of respect. You know, my father was a chiropractor, still is. And so I have a lot of healthy respect for the body's way to heal itself if given the right tools. So my approach is this integrative approach. And so I'll, I'll consult with people around the world and I will help them find resources in their local areas. And I have a lot of friends all over the place these days, which is fun. I get to speak to people in Slovenia and Romania and Australia and China. And like, there's so many amazing things happening in all these countries. And so um, I, just people just don't know about them. And so I, I'm happy to provide those resources and plug people in where I feel like they can be best helped. Yeah, perfect. And yeah, I think everyone would agree. It's, it's as you said, um, it sounds like hyperbaric oxygen therapy can be used as a foundational uh, tool to help your physiology try work, and then you tack on all these other modalities, either for monitoring or, you know, uh, simulation treatment, whatever it happens right. to be. Um, and health is always biopsychosocial. There's so many elements right. to health. Right, right. So that, I yeah. would say that's the foundation. Right? The biopsychosocial person part is the foundation, um, in the sense of making sure that you're, you know, that your cells are working well, that your gut is healthy, that you are optimizing your environment, which I'm not doing right now very well, but I'm trying. <laughs> but, you know, in general, it's, it's that, that part that's the most important for everybody, everybody, because we can do this every day. Are we, you know, my, my colleague, Dr. Ted, are you sleeping well? Are you loving well? Um, are your relationships well? I mean, is, are, are you grounded in, in general, right? Are you meditating? Are you, are, do you have daily practices? Are you exercising? Those are the foundation in my world. But the ultimate, you know, I'm going to be biased here, but the ultimate biohack, if I would have, have one, is, is hyperbaric therapy because it stimulates, it synergizes, it accelerates healing, accelerates the body's own ability to harness the power of, of energy to make the system better and to make the system more optimal. So what, I mean, it's, it's definitely one of the, let's call it a foundational biohack. How about that, Gary? We'll give you, we'll give it a both. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, it, you know, just speaking with someone like you, I, I, I want to try it out myself. I've never, I've only done the soft, 
hyperbaric chamber. Yeah. I've never done the hard one. I was always concerned thinking, are you going to get a bad side effect from doing it? You know, is there a risk if you're healthy and you go in there and you have an embolism, like an air embolism right. or something? Well, I just don't know. Treat so. air embolism, let me say it first, Gary. But the second, <laughs> but, but I mean, but, but risks are important. And I think that's, I mean, I know we have to go in a minute, but let me yeah. just dial this in real quick. Hyperbaric therapy is very safe. It's safer than taking an Advil or a Motrin, safer than taking a Tylenol for sure. <laughs> but um, but it has to be done within the framework of understanding what your goals are and what your risks are, okay? It does make your lungs work harder because you are under pressure. So you have to have normal lungs to go into a chamber. If you have COPD, if you have emphysema, if you have restrictive lung disease, pulmonary fibrosis, if you have any genetic diseases, that you have air pockets in your lungs, you shouldn't go into a chamber. In the US, hyperbaric therapy is a prescribed technology, okay? And I think it is in, 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 England, in England as well, not every country though. But I recommend that everybody goes into a chamber with some knowledge of what their risks are to go in. So lungs are the first thing. Heart, you have to have a normal heart to go in there too. You don't wanna have heart failure because it does put a little bit more stress on those blood vessels like we talked about, causing some constriction. If you have an uncontrolled seizure disorder, you don't want to go into a chamber. Oxygen toxicity can manifest as oxygen-induced seizures. That doesn't happen at the, at the more superficial pressures, but at the deeper pressures, it can. And that's when I was talking about air breaks before, when I was talking about how we give relative hypoxia in the chamber, that's because those air breaks prevent oxygen toxicity of the brain, okay? Uh, what also prevents oxygen toxicity is ke being ketogenic or using ketone supplements. And that's how Dom D'Agostino, the, the researcher in Florida, got interested in hyperbaric oxygen therapy because it was a way to simulate being underwater for Navy SEALs who couldn't breathe anything but 100% oxygen at very deep depths. Side note. Anyway, so oxygen-induced seizures are possible but very rare. Lung toxicity, cardiac toxicity, those are the major things that I think about when people go into the chambers. The biggest thing is ear trauma. So if you have um, any issues with your ears, we are giving you more pressure. Just like if you're on a plane, although the opposite amount of pressure, or if you're on a train or in a tunnel, you feel that popping sensation. That popping sensation is your major symptom when you're in the chamber, and that's normal. People don't typically have an issue with it. But if you let that pressure build up and you don't allow it to, uh, to release, then you can get trauma to your eardrums. But in general, Gary, hyperbaric therapy is very safe. If it's done just with a basic screening, uh, which actually we're working on providing from an online platform for everybody relatively soon as well. Um, if you want, at the Health Optimization Summit, uh, which is going to be in England, I think in September 14th, 15th, 15th, 14th September, as you would say, in um, next, next month, actually not next month, in September, coming up. Not sure when this is going to be released, but um, it's coming up. Um, There'll also be some soft chambers there. I'm going to be talking more about this there as well. Okay, fantastic. Uh, yeah, I hope to be at that summit. Uh, uh, it looks the lineup looks fantastic. So um, we're at our time now, and I just want to say thank you so much for the amount of information you've shared in such a condensed amount of time. Uh, I found this so informative myself. Uh, it's really excited to be able to share this with everyone that I can. Um, if anyone wants to get hold of you, uh, follow you online or anything. Mm -hmm. um, what are the social media accounts or places that you would recommend for listeners that I can share in the show in the sure. notes? So my website is integrativehbot.com. So it's the word integrative and the letters hbot.com. You can also just search my name, Scott Scher, S-H-E-R-R-M-D, on your favorite search engine, and all my stuff will come up, my lectures, my websites, and things like that. I also have a Facebook site that's the same integrative hbot, just facebook.com slash integrative hbot. I'm also on Instagram at Dr. Sure, actually, actually at Dr. Scott Sure, and uh, then those are the major places right now. I have a Twitter that I just I can't tolerate, you know, so I just I don't do toler I don't do too much Twitter, uh, but those are the major places. And like I said, I do do worldwide consultation and education advocacy. I do speaking events, and um, I I do a lot of work creating an ecosystem where people understand hyperbaric therapy in context, in the sense that it's not the end-all, be-all, cure-all. It is a significant foundational biohack, let's call it, where it can be very, very helpful for healing, and very, very helpful synergizing with other modalities and technologies, both ancient and cutting edge, to really help optimize the system. So 
in any of those places that I mentioned, you can find me and we can talk more or, you know, or you can ask questions and I'll try to answer them the best I can. Perfect. Thanks. And I'll put those in the show notes for listeners. Um, Scott, again, I've said it before, but I'll say it again. I, I really love that interview. That was so informative. And uh, again, I'm so glad I got to have you on the show. Thanks, Gary. Hopefully I didn't speak too fast. If you guys need to go to half speed for me, I apologize. It's my New York upbringing. Sometimes I just go very, very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.